you welcome back. We're going to lift from off the press uh, what made uh, the headlines on uh, national dailies. Uh, we're going to have uh, um, national dailies like the Daily Trust, the Punch, and the Independent, just three newspapers this morning. And we're starting with the Daily Trust. But we are being joined by our guest for this morning, uh, Mr. Ezekiel Nyaito, public affairs analyst, talking to us from Akwaibom State. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning and thanks for having me. Okay, let's begin first of all with uh, the Daily Trust newspaper. And uh, there are some very interesting headlines, like the one they're leading with. It says Ganduje tipped as APC national chairman. And the writers are Tinubu Shetima, host ex governor, then Uzadima, and two others. Progressive governors back move. Uh, for maybe uh, him to become the chair. An announcement to be made soon. Jubilation in Kano APC. Okay, your take on the fact that uh, the former Kano state governor uh, might just be the national chairman of APC. Yeah, um, you see, politics in Nigeria has become the main game and not governors. I was once a national chairman of um, a political party that was then rated as the fastest growing, and that's when we set up the Young Democratic Party, where I was a co-founder and the pioneer national chairman. Now, when you look at what we tried to do that really like um, set the fire was because we realize that there's a demography that is not captured in Nigeria, that is not brought into mainstream politics, and that's the youth. And we went out for the youth, and it opened the door. You know, uh, most people may not know this, that today YPP, Young Progressive Party, is an offshoot of YDP, uh, where the current chairman was my national youth leader and I handed over the party to him. And um, one way or the other, there was a movement from YDP to YPP. But then it's a party that is still there and making uh, some inroads here and there. But coming back to what I wanted to establish, now APC, in trying to get a national chairman has to have certain considerations. One of such considerations is what do we want to achieve? Do we want somebody that comes out and is a breath of fresh air, a departure from the conventional? Do we want so that the youth demography will go with them? Do we want somebody that will come and he has his personality, he has his character, he has his good conscience, he has this, you know, something that Nigerians will say, the new face, the new face of hope for Nigeria. Or do we want, you know, the old blood, the old game, we don't care about the young people, we don't care about morals and ethics, we don't care about anything, we just want to be able to plot our design and, you know, be able to get a certain section of the country and how will that work out at the end of the day? And don't forget that there are two options on the table. Option one is that the current government wins at the tribunal, wins at the appeal, and wins at the Supreme Court, so they stay. If they stay, what is the future of the party? Does it really matter? We are talking of the next election. In the next election, what are the permutations and combinations? Or is there a possibility that the tribunal could ask for a rerun of some sort? And on the basis of that, how do we? So I think is the, 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 the politics of numbers. And in the numbers, they are looking at Kano. But I think that I'm not a member of APC. I think that they may be making a very strategic mistake along the way. And they may be losing both ways. And there's even a third factor, which is the internal politics of um, Kano. Uh, you know, of um, for a while, there's there's been this seeming romance and relationship between one very important indigene of Kano and the current government, and the other people are feeling what's going on here. You know, there's unease within the APC camp in certain quarters. But I think that uh, President Tinubu should, as much as he cannot jettison politics, 
It should look more into posterity. God has made you a president, no matter how you look at it. Even if you are subsequently removed, I mean, you've been able to sit there for a minimum of six months, I would say. Uh, we seem to have lost the audio of uh, Mr. Ezekiel Nyaito, public affairs analyst, trying to make sense of the headlines that we have. And the headlines he was addressing was that Ganduje has been tipped, the former governor of uh, Kano State has been tipped to be uh, APC national uh, chair, the next APC national chair. Remember that uh, the, uh, the national chairman of APC and the secretary of Mr. Ray, um resigned a few days ago. It has been made public and official right now, and the people who are holding brief uh, placeholders are there. And uh, we, we had that word when we, we were doing the run-up to the elections. The placeholders are there, and um, now we are talking about a permanent solution to the chairmanship of APC. We do hope uh, that Mr. Ezekiel is back on now. Mr. Ezekiel, can you hear me? Yeah, I've been hearing you all along. Can oh, you hear me? Yeah, now I can yeah. hear you. We lost your audio yeah. before now. So please go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was hearing you all along, so I was wondering what happened. Mm -hmm. I was actually hearing everything. Okay. Okay. Anyway, bottom line is I think that the PM APC should really sit down and ask themselves exactly what they want. Because some of those calculations and permutations that they are making... Uh, at the risk of um, uh, sounding uncharitable, I think that Mr. Tinubu needs to know what sort of, you know, image he wants to put forward to Nigerians. Somebody who has come as a fantastic politician and a master of the game, or somebody who has come on a rescue mission to rescue Nigeria, to save Nigeria, even within his party, Somebody who has come to say, look, let's have a face that is inclusive. They are extremely vibrant, young, articulate people in APC from the north. That if you make them chairman today, wow, you will cut the ranks of the obedience. You will capture a section of the youth demography. You will get a lot of the people in Nigeria who are saying, look, we are sick and tired of all this government, I know all these old people, we are tired of them. Give us something refreshing. And for you to now bring Mr. Ganduluje as your preferred candidate, I I have my very serious reservations as to what, what informs your choices and what your choices are going to be going forward because the morning tells the day. The, the, the concern uh, of, of some people as well is that no, not only is Ganduje part of the whole old stock, as it were, uh, he's also under investigation. You know that they have renewed his investigation, the investigation into the case of his dollar bribe that they used to call uh, Gandola in those days. Gandola. Yes. So now he's under investigation and he's being touted to become the next APC chairman. Seems like everything you know every principal officer has a baggage that has not been taken out of their their necks but uh they're still good enough for the apc but right now you, let, let, let me say this like i ended earlier the morning tells the day i think somebody close to president tinubu should let him know the mood of the nation and what I may call the imperatives for success. There's a very urgent need for a rebranding, and he could not have a better option than this choice of a new national chairman. Let him look for a relatively young person that is very vibrant, that is very engaging, that has a good record, and there are many of them. Very many people in APC are my friends. Okay, they are my friends, and I know that these people, they are there. And let him look for one of those people and rebrand, start from rebranding APC to rebranding himself, so to speak. And he'll be able to carry a lot of Nigerians along. People are getting detached and they are falling off on a daily basis from what is going on. They expected that he would hit the ground running and then there will be a, a team to be able to manage the economy. Things are going haywire. We don't know the fuel subsidy thing is, is killing Nigerians. 
and we just want something to say, wow, that's nice. You know, all these other things, that, there's too much politics already. There's too much politics and mm. too little governance and something to make the average Nigerian to smile. Okay, you just talked about fuel going higher and higher. Um, uh, the, the other headline there on uh, the Daily Trust is more knocks for federal government over petrol price increase. Remember that Mele Kiari came out and said that market forces are the ones controlling the, the price. And we were even asking, do you really call these market forces when just a few people are in charge of these? Is that enough to call market forces? Maybe there are four or five people that can form a clique or a cabal. Uh, you, you call that market forces uh, when uh, the prices go high like this. And then I saw this morning someone on Twitter was saying that if you're patriotic enough, you should be happy to buy fuel at 700 naira. Uh, I don't know whether that is patriotism or uh, being docile or being, I, I don't know how to describe it. What is your take on what is going on in the oil sector where we are now buying fuel in Calabar? I think two days ago, we had reports that they bought for 700 naira when they were selling for 617 in Abuja and some parts of Lagos and all that. So what's your take on what is happening in petrol? So, so to say, not let me leave out diesel because that one has gone up a long time ago. The kerosene has gone up a long time ago. But now it's petrol that every aspect of our life seems to be tied to. And it's going higher and higher. It might get to a thousand naira. Two things. The very first thing is that last night I bought, you know, because of the way things are, some of us have devised ways of redesigning our houses and um, kind of um, running on what is sustainable, okay? Right now, there are petrol um, generators that can carry three ACs. If your bedroom AC is on, maybe your private parlor AC is on, you can leave one more. Do you understand me? And many of us have resorted to that. Some like myself, sometimes we have two or three of those, you know, standing by. So the big generators that take so much diesel we just keep them made them wait for now so we are kind of redesigning our lives to fit the current lifestyle even the big man you discover that you are leaving your big suvs for some days and then your daily runs you are looking for one other and smaller car that has fuel efficiency we are starting to redesign and become more especially those of us that are not in government but are private citizens but even with that Last night we bought petrol at 650 in Uyo. So it doesn't reach 700, thank God, but I bought 650 in Uyo. But let's drill down and talk about this petrol thing. One of the biggest problems that we have in Nigeria is this thing of everything being opaque. There are two things. The first thing is that you must understand that nobody buys something for two naira and sells it for 150 except government so the first thing you do is engage the public tell them come clean tell them that the cost reflective value and price of electricity bring it out transparently honestly with integrity is Five naira per kilowatt hour. Nigerians see that. Come to petrol. Bring it open. There are two things about petrol. One is, do we have a swap deal? Swap deal means I give you so much barrels of crude in exchange for so much, uh, you know, um, uh, petrol. If that be the case, there's nothing like exchange. Or there's nothing like exchange rates. Nothing like dollars, pressure on dollars. If you understand what I mean, it's like it's like um, a trade, trade by butter. Bat yeah, yeah, it's like a butter arrangement. If we are stopping that arrangement, what, what is the reason? Because if you come clean and say before a barrel of crude will give us maybe three uh, million liters of petrol, but because of price differentials. A barrel cannot give us three million barrel, three million um, liters again, but maybe uh, two point nine. So the the, 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 the the differential is in how much you get back, but it has nothing to do with dollars. It has nothing. Second option is 
you buy my crude at the market rate and then you pay me my dollars. I use my dollars and buy your own petrol at your own rate. And my question is, why would I rather not do a butter, which is the, the swap deal? What is the problem? My brother, the problem is corruption, being opaque, lack of transparency, lack of accountability. As at today, every country has access to know the production from the rig, from the extraction. The president can know in his office on a screen the amount of crude that comes out from every um, oil well. He can know. But he would rather not know. That's why we talk of bunkering. Why we talk of how much is lost. Because if I know how much comes from the from the from the drill head, and I know that today I have two million barrels. There's no question of why I will not have value for my two million barrels. Oh, they stole this, they didn't steal that. Where did they steal? At what point did it miss? Whose section was it? What is the explanation? Mr. Tinubu, my governor, should, my president should please think of transparency and accountability. That is why people just drove towards Peter Obi. It wasn't like there was anything, you know, fanciful about Peter Obi. They just expected that he would come with a different mindset because that's what he did when he was a governor. Even when they impeached him, he still continued, he stayed on that lane and said, look, public funds should be done with public conscience. Good conscience. So what am I trying to say at the end of the day? We really don't know how much crude we are making. We really don't know how much it is that comes to Nigeria. When it comes to Nigeria, there's plus, 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 tax, 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 tax. If you remove all the plus, plus, all the tax, tax, what's the bare bone? Because you can't collect tax on one hand and they tell you are subsidizing on another hand. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. You know, when you remove, you say, I'm buying for two naira, the exchange rate is this. So it's landing at the wharf for X amount of money. And every Nigerian knows that X amount of money. They know that there's, this is a cost reflective price for power, this is a cost reflective price for fuel, and other things. And you tell Nigerians, if we are to subsidize this and subsidize this, the two subsidies coming together will cost us, say, 5 million naira. But we don't have 5 million naira. We have an option to borrow. And borrowing will go a problem. Or we ask you to just pay a little. When you pay this little, what is cost reflective for the people that can afford, then we create an alternate window. That alternate window could be if you go to NNPC stations and you know you are ready to sleep there, you can buy it at this rate. But if you are a businessman and you don't have that, whatever, you can buy from this other station. That is one option. Second option is, gentlemen, let's make this thing. You have your cars, you can go in your cars, but the poor man does not have his car. So we are going to make public transportation system available for then within the next, we have an emergency train that cuts across and then internally buses that run on certain principles based on a PPP arrangement, private public partnership arrangement, so that a businessman works on it to make it to be sustainable. Number three, we tell ourselves, how come that APC was in government for eight years and not one refinery was fixed? Who has been able to answer the question as to the mystery why they could not fix one refinery? If these refineries are unfixable, can we now plan to build a new refinery from the scratch like Dangote did? Eight years is more than enough. In fact, it gives you a basis for people to say, oh, let him have a second term because this refinery has already gone to about 70% completion. We don't want it to stop. So let it. And then you now say, these other three, look, what do we do with them? You scrap them, you sell them. The Americans say, cut your losses. 
I mean, this is a sort of thinking you come to Nigerians, engage them, and say, which route do we take? And you get the buy-in of the generality of Nigerians, and you attack that route honestly and sincerely, and they will stop having this. Nigerians will now know if they are making sacrifices, they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I think it's uh, John you know, Winston Churchill that says that hope is the anchor that stabilizes the soul. Once Nigerians can see where we are going, they can make sacrifices knowing that there is an, ult uh, an ultimate end in sight. But for right now, everything is opaque. Everything is, is mysterious. Everything is just there. And we don't know where we are coming from, where we are going. Mm. We, we know where we are going. We are going to have 8,000 Naira given to us for six months. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> they, say, they say we will consider, reconsider. Yeah. Who are they? All no, right. No, no. Well, no, no. well, that's just an aside. Wait, now, who are they? We. Okay. Everybody knows how government is run. That's why they said there should be ministers. There should be ministries, there's organized private sector, and there, there's labor. Do you understand me? When you say we, we're talking government, the whole apparatus of government, sitting, doing the necessary, you know, works, and coming up with a national reflective, con, you know, consensus. So when you are there alone as Mr. President, no ministers, the boards are not there, and, things, and you say we. Well, talking uh, about boards, uh, we've just seen that uh, Tinubu is still in, uh, on daily trust. Uh, the president, Tinubu, returns NEDC board members and management replaced by Buhari. When Buhari came, some people were, were removed by the Jonathan administration. One of them is uh, Mena, Abdul Rashid Mena of the pensions uh, saga. Uh, Jonathan removed him. Buhari came and replaced him, uh, and, and brought him back, rather, and the case continued like that. Now Tinubu has come, people replaced by uh, Buhari, he's seeking their return into the board, the NEDC, the Northeast uh, Development Commission. He's seeking the return of these people, these board members. Uh, so what is your take on that? One government removes some people, another one returns them. I, I think that every government uh, has the right to say this was not properly done, um, there was no basis for this removal. I bring the file, I look at the files, and I see that, look, um, there's no basis for this people being removed. As a result, please let them come back and continue their work. Now, that is possible. I actually have nothing against him. The, only, the other thing is that it could be a political expediency, because this has to do with the North, and he feels that uh, he has two options. First is that it could have been an opportunity for him to put a certain quality of people back there. But if these are the people that um, during the campaign, they worked for him and um, like they had a deal, they had an understanding and they delivered, then he might also have to um, reward them by keeping to an agreement they had before time. So I don't know why he's bringing them back. Either he's found them to be extremely competent, you know, so he brings them back. That could be a good reason. Or they had a deal before election and said, oh, God, we'll rob your back, you rob our back. We'll come together, we'll deliver this, and then when you win, you bring us back since we're already there. That's a possibility. The third possibility is that he just thinks that for whatever he's worth, let him satisfy certain blocks or understandings. The final is that they could have been people that he masterminded their being there. And then President Buhari got to know that, wow, somebody has caught the carpet, you know, beneath, beneath my feet. And he's like, no, 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 this Tinubu is having his tentacles everywhere. So, bam, get them out. They got them out. And then Tinubu comes back and he's like, sorry, guys. You know, there's a return of the mark. So <laughs> he brings them back. Whichever game that is being played, I, I pray that it is done on account of the fact that he's found them to be extremely, com extremely competent and, you know, square pegs in square holes. And he brings them back in the larger interest of the Northeast Development Commission. Because that commission is, if you know the history of that commission, you know, it was likened to something like the NDDC for the South-South. Yeah. So I think it's a commission that should be extremely important, especially now that the Northeast is so ravaged, 
is a commission that should come in as an interventionist agency and really hit the ground running and really work for the larger good of the generality of the people of that um, uh, constituency. If that is his consideration, God will bless him because the people that are suffering, man, Okay. They are suffering. Uh, yeah. Indeed, they are suffering. Those guys are suffering. Yeah, let's move to the Punch newspaper. Uh, the biggest headline there is fuel price hike, business operators panic, fear shutdown, and job losses. The writers on that story are hike to worsen manufacturers' woes. Many SMEs will die. Uh, manufacturers Association of Nigeria, LCCI, lament. And we also have NLC considers emergency meeting. PDP slams federal government as rep summon NNPCL boss. Now, you are an architect. You are a businessman as well. Tell us how biting this hike in fuel price is to you as a businessman so that we can use that to relate to other businessmen and manufacturers that we have. I'll tell you that I don't know the word to use on this issue of fuel. A bad combination to a businessman of fuel and exchange rate. I'm a developer and I have an estate. Some people have paid me full for the houses I develop. I had done my mathematics and everything. The fuel prices have just come and destroyed everything I had done because all the prices of all the products in the market have all changed. What moral rights do I have to go back to a man who had paid me full and he will have his house by December? And I was working according to timelines, and I was meeting timelines, and all of a sudden, in the past one month or two months, everything has gone haywire. I'll give you a very little e example. I don't, how do I do this without getting too personal? My family member have suffered so much. I decided, okay, let them take a break because of my involvement in politics. So I told them, okay, go take, have a break. They were going BTA, applying at 400 and something naira bta they were applying they are already applying everything all of a sudden within one week that window was closed a new window was open sunday is my wife's birthday i'm now having to move from 400 maybe from three family members maybe with a minimum of maybe ten thousand dollars from about four million you have to bring out about about 10 million, 8 million. There's a differential that just doesn't make sense within a few weeks. Come back to business. In petrol, all your calculations that you were working on prices in the market, you now have to up your calculations by over 30%, whereas you have already collected the money from the people. So right now, I'm having to do everything to cut all my losses. I'm just wondering, my guy, if I'm to say, let me return your money, how much will you charge me? If, if it's like 10%, it becomes easier for me to return your money than for me to look for additional 30% to come and complete and meet the contract and maintain integrity. It's a difficult thing. How do you call the people back and say, please don't be annoyed. Prices have changed. They said, my guy, sorry, we have another contract. I paid you 100%. And as a result, so as a businessman now, the question is, how much can you take up front on something you're about to do? Because you don't know how the prices are going to change. The foreign exchange rate is just going haywire. The petrol rate and petrol affects, you know, people don't know this. Petrol affects everything. Everything, including vegetable in the market. You say, uh, how does that woman paid transport to come to the market? And that transport has changed because of petrol. So the price of gari has changed. The price of vegetables have changed. Businessmen are just wondering, what do I do? Can I just shut down? At a stage, I actually considered selling my whole estate, looking for somebody that would just buy it off me and get the bulk money, exchange it at whatever rate, 
November one, I'll be 60. And just go and relax. I've had enough. But the question is, if we do this, what are we leaving back to Nigeria that brought us up? And for someone like me, my case is double jeopardy. I am one person that owes Nigeria. This will be very strange to many people. Nigeria gave me the best education that anybody could give anybody in the world. It sent me to a school from the village where I lived with my grandmother, and I knew nobody. I had no connection. I had nothing. I moved from the village in in Biokwikorong, in the Konoloko government area, where I lived with my grandmother, to federal government college, Wari, that was rated the ninth, the best in West Africa and the ninth best in the Commonwealth. And today I can be speaking big English and be appreciated by people because of the education Nigeria gave me. How do I leave this Nigeria and go away to another country? I will not, my conscience will not allow me. But will Nigeria allow me to breathe? Nigeria has their knees on my neck. It's a problem for me. Others, Nigeria didn't do anything for them. They can have jackpot, they can do anything. But I can't do that. My conscience can't allow me. So let people who come into government, please know that they came to serve. Let them have a conscience and take decisions that are in the larger interest of the generality of the poor. And the poor are so much. Go to the villages, you will weep. In our language, I'm sorry to say this, there's what we call it, Ubri Idiom. Idiom is like, it's like, like a native doctor of the worst order. My brother, I'm telling you on tape recorded by NTA crew that went with me from village to village, there are graduates that have gone to learn how to do that witchcraft and everything. And they are initiating others because they have no work to do. They are graduates that at night use torch light and climb palm tree, harvest it, carry it on their head and come down because if it falls, people will hear to steal. Things are difficult. Things are hard. Things are terrible. With Nigerians are going through stuff. And then we, we are talking of buying bulletproof vehicles for, for principal uh, uh, water or the National Assembly. We are leaving innocent to go and bring imported SUVs for, for National Assembly members. We are the, God has to help us. We can't continue like this. We can't. We need to have a little bit of conscience for the poor. People are suffering. This night, a woman who has fasted to have a child for seven years is going to lose that child today, today, today. Why? She does not have 2,000 naira to pay for the medical bill that is required. And these nurses, they've developed a thick skin because too many people have put too much wahala on their heads. And the owners of the hospitals are like, you take another person, you lose your salary. So, madam, if you know if you pay that two naira, sorry. And you will sit there and watch that boy breathe his last and he's gone. People are going here. Why? People are going. There's, there's this, you know, no, I don't know. People are, there's problems. But our leaders don't seem to know. And they're going on long convoys. They are going on private jets. They are going on. When people, he said, Rome is burning while, well, you know, Nero is, is, is having headphones over his head, you know, and, and doesn't know what, seem to know what is going on. How long will this be? I think the time has come mm. when we should be. Sorry, let me just end on this because. I don't know. Today, I'm just not. Uh, I'm not just not feeling it. I'm. I'm. I'm pained. I'm. 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 On, I'm not. I'm. On, I'm unhappy. People are suffering, and our leaders don't seem to know. They've forgotten the past, including people like me that grew up in the villages. They've forgotten what the villages are like. They are elites. They are in their mansions. I'm forgetting what is going on in the villages. Sorry, I've heard my quick close, bro. <laughs> no, I'd like you to just give me a one minute. Uh, answer to this. Um, we've seen headlines in, in Daily Independent, reps ask Tinubu to lift embargo on employment. But we, another smaller headline says, uh, Senate tells employers to remove age limit from employment. That's on the Daily Independent. So there is embargo on employment. And if the embargo is lifted, do, does Nigeria have the money to pay more employees? Uh, if uh, that embargo is lifted, because the first time the reason for placing the embargo possibly is that okay, we have enough uh, hands and maybe we don't have enough money to pay the other people that will be employed. All right, now another uh, group is asking the Senate is asking employers to remove uh, age limit from uh, employers 
or, or would-be employees rather, or applicants that were trying to get a job and all that. So just combine this together and see how uh, you can answer it briefly. On the one hand, okay. embargo, and the other, other yeah. hand, age limit. Just, yes. like, just like Number state one, of origin, yeah. Sorry? Just like state of origin, people are saying, remove it from yeah. all applications. Yeah. Yeah. I want to tell my people in the National Assembly that um, sitting down there and legislating certain things without wondering how practical it is, just let it sound nice. We say they should employ. At the end of the day, I don't know how honest you are with Nigerians and with yourself. How do you employ? How do you raise minimum wage? What is our national income? What do we have? Can you afford? Come clean, number one. Number two, why do we think creation of jobs has to do with government employment, which is, a, 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 to put it in a very harsh word, a redundancy camp, you know, with apologies to very few civil servants that are really giving their lives to save this country. You know, you realize that you just go into civil service and it's like, now some, some states are saying, work two days, work three days, bring more people in. If you want to create jobs, stimulate the private sectors, MSMEs, I will tell you for free what to do. Number one, let President Tinubu know that foundationally, you cannot have a stable economy without food security. That is the highest national security and threat you should look at. You cannot have food security except farmers go to farm. Farmers cannot go to farm where the major farm bells have been taken over by this insurgent. I expected that the first thing that the president would do is to create peace and stability by stamping out. He calls it service chiefs and tells them, look, I want to give you this appointment. Can you give me an undertaking that within six months, tell me what your profile will be. Pitch to me, you know, what, what I, I'm going to benchmark you on. And I'm giving you this for a professional period of three months. Tell me what you'll do in three months. If not, so I'll remove you. The issue of making you a service chief and you're a permanent a, a, a paramount ruler is not going to happen again. So if you are a service chief, tell me, IG, what are you going to do? Um, the, the Minister of Defense, or no, no, not the, 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 the Chief of Defense Staff, Chief of Army Staff, Chief of Naval Staff, give me your template on what you want to do for me in the next three months. Then the next three months, three, three months, milestones, you don't meet them, I change you, okay? When he does that, the people will go in with the aim of... <laughs> Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Just wrap up. Just, yeah. uh, These people will go in knowing that they have a target. And then you don't meet the target. Nigerians know that, oh boy, you don't meet the target, you're going to move. That I'll be willing to change my service chiefs every three, three months. Every three, three months. But that peace and stability, I must have it. I will not compromise it. I'm declaring an emergency because without peace and stability, there will be no farmers working. Without farmers working, there will be no food security. Without food security, the inflation is going to go haywire. With inflation going haywire, there will be no economy. It's just foundational peace and security, stability in the north is farmers going back to farm. IDP comes being dismantled within six months. Everybody goes back there. That is my priority one. Priority one, peace and security. Southeast, what is going on? IPOP, ESN, come. What's the problem? All the leaders of the Southeast, come and sit and have a meeting with me. I release Namdi to you. As from today, no longer sitting at home. As from today, if I have any problem, I will remove anybody, declare a state of emergency, and take over the Southeast because the Southeast is very important to me. All this Aba made thing, industrialization, I'm coming back to Aba to make sure that before you used to have two inferior products in Nigeria, before Aba made and Taiwan, in my days, Aba made and Taiwan, those were the two inferior products. Now, where is Taiwan? Where is Abamed? I'm coming back. That Abamed has to come back, whatever it takes. I'm going to nail with what do we innocent? 
now this is your car thing. There's a government policy. We are going to use locally made vehicles. Tell me what you need. And if they're not, you can also assemble a vehicle and they say, let me know. Let's balance out. So that it's not like I'm only supporting the South. What can happen in the North? Textile industries. The North, it must come back. We leave the rest of those uh, paraphernalias and all those uh, heat majors and fundamentals. Okay. Then there's peace, there's food security, the economy starts to breathe. And we start to have a Nigeria that works. Okay. Any other thing, all those uh, increased salary, mm -hmm. this is all those things are just things that will not take us anywhere. Okay, uh, well, this is where we really have to uh, drop it this morning. I uh, would like, like to thank you, uh, Mr. Ezekiel Nyaitok, for coming on the program and helping us make sense of the headlines. Thanks so much. I promise that next time I'll be more... <laughs> well, more you, you can never predict that. And say us well to Madame, who will be uh, celebrating her birthday on Sunday. We wish her a oh. happy birthday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll Go take ahead. a short break now. And when we return, we'll be looking at our first hot topic, which is Nigerians grown as high fuel prices shrink incomes and worsen poverty. Stay with us. <laughs> 